Hello, my name is Philippe Girin, a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. My name's Lane Buckles. I'm a student from the history department at McNeese. My name is Sarah Miller, also from the history department at McNeese. Welcome to Your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She was an indigenous woman of Inca descent and a revolutionary leader. She was also a martyr who fought and died alongside her husband. This truly incredible woman lived a life of hardships and tragedy, but she is remembered today as a symbol of strength and indigenous pride in Peru. Her name was... Michaela Bastidas, who led a failed rebellion against Spanish rule in 18th century Peru and endured a pretty horrible death. We'll discuss her execution in some detail, so fair warning, things might get a bit bloody towards the end. Along the way, we'll sample some Quechua language artists as well as Peruvian punk rock. Wow, Peruvian punk rock, that's quite a program here. Bonus fact, did you know that Peru has claimed the invention of the punk rock genre? I sure didn't, I'm just a lame middle-aged historian. Lima's Los Psychos are believed by many to have been the first punk rock band ever, having formed in 1964. So you, Sarah, did the research for today's show. You are the expert today, so we will just ask questions and you will lead the conversation. Our first song of the day is Demolition by Los Psychos. Bonjour and welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks. We just listened to Demolition. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. I'm Lane Buckles. And I'm Sarah Miller. Today we're exploring the life of Micaela Bastidas, the woman who led a revolution against Spanish rule in colonial Peru. All right, so why don't we start at the beginning? Tell us where and when she was born. Micaela Bastidas Pucahoya was born in 1744 in the Tamburco district of Peru. 1744, so we're talking about the colonial period. 
do we have a lot of info on her early life? Because a lot of the women that I've showcased on this show, they left very few traces in the archives. It is an issue, yes. Fewer records exist of her than of her more famous husband, Tupac Amaru II. What we do know is that she was listed as an illegitimate child in her birth certificate. Her mother's name was Josefa. Her, her father, Manuel Bastidas, was either a priest or a man of African descent. So you're saying that she was possibly mixed race, indigenous and African? Right. Spanish-held colonies had strict laws concerning the status of race and meticulously graded people by the quote-unquote quantity of Spanish blood in their veins. The limpieza de sangre was called the purity of your blood. Obviously, people of purely Spanish descent would be on the top of this hierarchy and black and indigenous people would be on the bottom. And still, despite the racial stratification of their society, Spanish colonies also had a high rates of miscegenation. Miscegenation meaning mixing races. And you're right, the Spanish were pretty obsessed with those racial categories. In class, I showed you a series of paintings that were done to illustrate all the various racial categories in Latin America, not just white, indigenous, and African, but also any intermediate categories, like a quarter African and three quarter white, so half indigenous and half white and so on. So if Michaela Bastidas was indeed a person with an African father and an indigenous mother, then she was Sambo, part indigenous, part African. And that brings us back to Micaela. There were racial hierarchies within the racial hierarchies, and her illegitimate status would have further alienated her from her indigenous communities. The mix-up over her racial status comes down to inconsistencies in the records from the time. Some records show that both of her parents were white, others marking her as indigenous, and still others have her marked as being mixed race. That is very strange. If racial categories mattered so much to Spaniards, you'd think that the records would have been better kept. What we do know for a fact is that she was raised in the predominantly indigenous highlands of Peru, that her first primary language was Quechua, and that she was a devout Catholic. Leaving aside racial markers to look at more cultural markers, we've got two clues here. First, language. Quechua, the traditional language of the Incas, was her native tongue. Second, religion. She embraced the Catholic religion imported by Spain. So she was truly caught between two worlds, European and indigenous. Want to hear about Quechua? Absolutely. Our next song is by Los Nin, a group who raps in Quechua. It's called Quina Somos. Quechuan rap. That's the kind of stuff you can only hear right here on KBYS. Yeah. 
Y mantes para que usas para que vuelvas 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 para que
Bonjour à tous and welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on KBYS. Je suis Philippe Girard. I'm Lane Buckles. And I'm Sarah. Today we're covering the life of Micaela Bastidas, who played a key role in the biggest revolt against Spanish rule in South America. She's not as well known as her husband, Tupac Amaru II, the official leader of that revolution, but you seem to think that she should get more recognition. Explain why. Tupac and Micaela's marriage was known as an equal partnership, but nobody could deny that she was the driving force of the revolution. She had a dominant personality, she recruited soldiers to the rebellion, and she was direct authority over the land controlled by the rebellion. She was also a better and more daring strategist than her husband. Earlier you mentioned that Spain conquered Peru and then imposed strict racial categories that put indigenous people at the bottom, and then they also enforced a labor tax that essentially enslaved Indians for part of the year and pushed for the unpopular Bourbon reforms. All of these would have been good reasons to revolt. But do we know more precisely what Micaela's own goals were for that rebellion? Micaela wanted to drive out the Spanish completely, reclaim the land for her people, and reestablish the role of indigenous women in the community, which had been pushed down by the Spanish. Wow. So not just racial and social equality, but gender equality too. In fact, there were multiple other women in leadership amongst the rebels. So how did the rebellion go? The rebellion truly began on November 4th, 1780, when Tupac Amaru II's army captured and executed a local Spanish commander, Antonio de Aragia, who had been charged with enforcing the work quotas. The headquarters for the rebellion were up in the Andes outside of Cusco. Cusco, that was once the capital of the Inca Empire, so that is symbolic. So how did the rebels get their weapons? Because typically, indigenous people were not allowed to have weapons in colonial Latin America. That was one of Micaela's jobs. She supplied the soldiers with anything they could possibly need, from food and clothing to weapons and ammunition. She also organized an efficient communication system by implementing the traditional indigenous system. You're referring to the Shasky system, C-H-A-S-K-I, because back in pre-Columbian times, this is how the Incas used runners to carry important news up and down the Inca trails of the Indies. Yes, like that, but on horseback, because the Spanish had introduced horses by this time. She also created a security system to combat any attempts by the Spanish to spy on the rebellion. All right, you saw me. She indeed played a central role planning and executing the rebellion of her husband. So what about the fighting itself? Because in the show, we've portrayed a few women who actively took part in battles, like Queen Nzinga of Angola and the Mongol princess Kutulun. But aside from them, generally war is a man's world. Quechua women, including Micaela, also participated in the fighting. She was particularly fierce in battle, and following a, battle, a victory at the Battle of Sangarara on November 18, 1780, she was made the leader of the revolution. Tupac Amaru II sent out a call to action for Creoles and other non-white Peruvians to join the rebellion because, in his own words, we are all compatriots as we were born in these lands and are of the same origin. I was about to ask, where did they draw the line between allies and their enemies? Creole means born in the Americas as opposed to the Peninsulares, the Spanish people born in Spain. I see why Tupac and Micaela would want the Creoles on their side. This was a war of independence, after all. But what about the racial element? Some white Creoles would probably be uncomfortable joining a revolt led by the indigenous masses. Well, that's the problem. Some of the rebels killed all people of Spanish descent indiscriminately, even those born in Peru. This scared the elite members of the Creole population. So instead of a movement for independence, local Creoles against Spanish colonizers, this revolt turned into a social and a racial war, indigenous peasants against the elites, and that would most definitely scare the elites. Yeah, things didn't end well. Before we get to the tragic end, though, let's take another musical break. This is Kai Kunape by Liberato Kani, an indigenous Peruvian artist who raps in Quechua. Mo Quechuan rap. All right. Suena fuerte, que esto suena fuerte, el quechua en resistencia, 
Kai kunapi, nyuhan puritskani, tu guilao, taki muspalin tarimachkani, wasi mantelus humus pa nyuhan pasarhani, kai mi puncho han kunapa yakta masi kunapa, muchkai ki hip hop, kai ki yavi, tuta hatari muspa, altuman hawaspa, humaita muyuspa, agurmani kunaham kuna hatari muinchik, agurmani kunaham kuna hatari muinchik, pa soy desperté, con la gana de querer conocer, viajar, de sentirme bien, my friend, influyendo con el viento cantar, de toda la cultura que queda en mi retina cada vez que paso por aquella esquina de nombre que quedó marcado en la historia de nuestra nación somos el canto que nunca se perdió tan fuerte como un tenor que se escuche mi voz en cada rincón hay kunapi nyuhan puritskani tu guilao taki muspalin tarimachkani wasi mantelus que muspa nyuhan pasarhani kai mi puncho han kunapa yachtamasi kunapa muchkai ki hip hop kai ki yapi tuta hatari muspa altuman hawaspa humaita muyuspa agurmani kunaham kunaham Hatari Muinchik, Agurmani Kuna Ham Kuna Hatari Muinchik. Tranquilo vivo en mi tierra de paisajes y colores, de costumbres y regiones que al pasar del tiempo formo parte de mi vida mientras sigo relajado con una sonrisa. Donde el caminar por avenida de nuestra serranía, expresión y música para la poesía de este viajero bohemio que solo danza con la cultura andina que siente mi alma. Sí. Con la cultura andina que siente mi alma, sí. Con la cultura andina que siente mi alma, que. Kai kunapi, yohan puritskani, tu guilao, taki muspalin tarimachkani. Wasi mantelus que muspa yohan pasarhani. Kai mi punto han kunapa yachta masi kunapa. Much kai ki hip hop, kai ki yapi, tu ta hata y muspa. Altu man hawaspa, humaita muyuspa. Agurmani kuna ham kuna hatari muinchik. Agurmani kuna ham kuna hatari muinchik. Si yo digo música, tú me respondes vida. Música, vida, música, vida. Si yo digo música, tú me respondes vida. Música, vida, música, vida. El que hecho en resistencia, que, que el que hecho en resistencia. Lima y pueblo, la voz popular, sí. Liberato en la casa, hermano. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. I'm Sarah Miller. I'm Lane Buckles. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Today we are retracing the life of Peruvian rebel Micaela Bastidas. When we left off, Micaela and her husband Tupac had become the leaders of a massive rebellion against Spanish rule. Against Spanish rule, but also against the elite in general, which had a way of scaring off the powerful Creole elite of Peru. So take us to the high of the rebellion and the lows. In March of 1781, they led a rebel army of 7,000 men and women. Their followers proclaimed Tupac Amaru the emperor of the Americans and referred to Micaela as their queen. So that's the high point. They recreated the old Incan empire. But what about the low point? Unfortunately, the rebellion would tragically end after only six months. In April 1781, Micaela, Tupac, and much of their inner circle were captured in a failed attack. She had encouraged her husband to lead his army into Cusco to take advantage of the city's guard being weakened by a first wave of attack, but instead he held back. This led their army to be weak and ultimately spelling their demise. I know what happened to the couple after they were captured by the Spanish because we studied this in class, but go ahead and walk us through the process. I'd like to issue a warning here. The manner in which Micaela Bastidas met her death is very graphic. Oh yes, 18th century justice in general was very graphic. And rebellion against the state, that was about the worst crime you could think of. So Tupac and Michaela, they were in for a terrible time. They were. On May 18th, 1781, Micaela Bastidas, Tupac Amaru II, and one of their sons were publicly executed by the Spanish. In Cusco, right? In the main public square? Right. The family was killed one by one, with their son Hipolito being the first to die, in front of his parents. The Spanish cut out the young man's tongue for the crime of speaking out against them, and then they put him to death by hanging. Micaela and Tupac were made to watch the whole thing. Wow. I can't imagine witnessing this as a parent. Micaela was next. She fought to the very end, but eventually she was subdued. Like her son, her tongue was cut out. They attempted to hang her in the same way, but her neck was too thin. So instead, they strangled her and hit her with a club, eventually kicking her to death. She was 37 years old. 
horrible but sadly typical. I've gone through a lot of records of public executions in 18th century Haiti, and one key step was always the apology. The criminal or the rebel was always expected to confess his or her crimes in public, make amends, and then die. And this way, authorities could restore public peace with the collaboration of the rebel. And clearly, Michaela, she refused to play along. She fought back, and eventually they had to silence her by cutting her tongue. What about her husband? After being forced to watch his family die, Tupac Amaru II also had his tongue cut out. Then his arms and legs were tied to four horses in an attempt to pull him to pieces. Drawing and quartering. I've seen that in Haiti too, in cases of treason. So I recall this mode of execution was a bit tricky to pull off. The human body is surprisingly tough. It didn't work. The horses just failed to dismember him. So he was beheaded like his ancestor, the first Tupac Amaru. What a horrible end for a family whose sole crime was to fight for freedom for their land. We're not done yet. Tupac and Micaela's youngest son, Fernando, was forced to watch his whole family die. He was spared the executioner's blade due to his young age, so he spent the rest of his life in jail. Wow. His mother and father's corpses were cut into bits. Their, their torsos were burned and their limbs were sent to all corners of the country to be displayed as a warning to those who would dare challenge the Spanish. So if you're interested in that topic, I would recommend reading the book Discipline and Punish by the French philosopher Michel Foucault. He studied gruesome 18th century public executions like Michaela's, and he argued that, however barbaric, these executions were not just random violence, that they were a carefully sought-out ceremonial, a way for the state to assert its supremacy over the body of the condemned. And in the case of poor Michaela Bastidas, utterly destroy her and everything that she stood for. Well, not completely. The Spanish may have killed her, but not her ideas. Like Braveheart in Scotland, Micaela Bastidas seeded an indigenous nationalism that would grow and evolve, and 40 years after her death, on July 28, 1821, Peru would finally gain independence from Spain. To this day, she and Tupac Amaru II remain powerful symbols in Peru, especially among the indigenous population. Their rebellion was broken, so was their body, but their will was intact, and in the end, their ideas prevailed. That's a way to end on a more positive note, yes. Despite all the gore, they won out in the end. What a life. Tragic and gory, but inspiring too. And we're very glad that we could share it with you. Thank you, Sarah. Before we go, we need to mention that this program was funded by a Juliet Hartner grant for women in the humanities. For more information on how to help finance fellowships at McNeese, contact the foundation at 337-475-5588. This program was also sponsored by the History Department at McNeese State University. So to apply for a degree in history or, God forbid, another field, contact the McNeese Admissions Office at 475-5504. Thank you and goodbye.